Arts. So please welcome Sharmi Gandhi. Hello, Austin. How are you guys? Good. Okay. I'm Sharmi. I'm EVP of Corporate Development at Bustle Digital Group, and I'm here to talk about M&A, pre-close work for post-close success. Big green button. So Henry Ford once said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. And I think this is a really great analogy for M&A. Um, if you think about it, coming together is the deal signing. Keeping together is the, you know, the first 30, 60, 90 days of integration, where there's a lot of excitement, a lot of momentum. But working together, you know, and actually establishing a way for that acquisition to settle into your organization is really how you unlock success. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, which I think is a lesser discussed topic. Um, it's, you know, you can buy a company, but can you run it successfully? So before getting into that, a little bit about what's going on in the market. I'm sure you guys are all pretty aware of this, but there's been some interesting transactions we've seen this year. Um, you know, even though 2022 feels very different than 21, and when it comes to the economy and just you know financial markets in general. Um, we've actually, it, McKinsey has said that M&A globally, just even outside of media, is just slightly lower than 21, and it's actually pretty much on par for pre-pandemic levels. So um, there has been a lot of momentum and movement. So we've seen the sales of, of Axios, of, of Dwell, of Quartz, of Attention, and outside of publishing, we've seen some market-altering transactions, um, Amazon buying a nearly century-old studio, uh, MGM, who would have thought that a few years ago. Um, we've seen Spotify continue to roll up the podcasting space, um, and we've seen Warner Media change hands once again now um, with Discovery. So some trends I'm seeing impacting m and I've highlighted three here. Um, number one, unfriendly macro conditions. I don't think I need to tell this room. There's been a lot of uncertainty around the economy. Um, specifically when it comes to our business models in media, um, you know, there's threats on the ad market, ad sales side, um, there's softness that we're seeing there. We're seeing um, consumer spending pullback um, when it comes to subscription models that are affecting subscription models, but also affecting affiliate models. Um, we're seeing debt costs on the rise, which is making, you know, using debt to finance transactions more difficult. We're seeing um, depressed company valuations, generally speaking, so using stock as a currency is also hard to transact. Um, number two is limited options for exit. So if you rewind 18 months ago, there was, you know, a SPAC frenzy. Um, there was a feeling as a private company in this space, you could kind of control your own destiny. You could actually go public through a SPAC or through a traditional IPO. Um, but, you know, arguably the SPAC market has dried out. Um, IPOing in a traditional way is very difficult right now. So it, it limits the options that you have. So you're seeing companies, you know, according to the press, uh, like Forbes and Vice that are now considering sales instead of, you know, using SPACs as a vehicle. And number three is increased PE interest in media. Um, so you're seeing the likes of Blackstone and Apollo and Providence pour, you know, a sizable amount of capital into uh, media companies, you know, arguably to continue consolidation and rolling up the, in the industry. Um, and we're going to get into f uh, these th trends a little bit more at the roundtable if you guys want to join the roundtable in, um, in the next hour or so. So BDG uh, is a company that's grown through acquisition. So we were established in 2013 um, with our anchor brand, Bustle, which is definitely what everyone still knows us as. Um, and since then, we've made 10 acquisitions. Uh, the majority of our acquisitions are consumer-facing editorial brands. Um, we have made a couple acquisitions uh, for capabilities, specifically in the experiential space, as well as uh, tech capabilities. Um, my, my story at BDG actually has two chapters. Um, I was part of the team at Mike, uh, who helped sell Mike into BDG back in 2018 and helped transition the business. And then I rejoined the company about 18 months ago to, to lead corporate development and oversee uh, business development. And so I have a dual perspective, you know, from a, a buyer's perspective, of course, but also from a seller's perspective into BDG. A little bit more about us. We reach 180 million consumers. Um, and to Steve's 
original point, you know, we look at our audience base from an omni-channel perspective. So that covers off our on-site traffic, our social followings, and our newsletter subscribers. So a roll-up strategy is simple, but execution of it can be challenging. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what BDG does to help mitigate that risk. Um, you know, buying companies is not rocket science, but running them is a whole different story. And in fact, you see a lot of, um, you're starting to see articles in the press about how companies that are embarking on roll-up strategies um, are not being operated that cleanly, right? You're seeing words like chaos and lack of transparency and um, un, you know, unexpected layoffs. And uh, it, it's difficult. If you can't actually run the operational side, it's hard to extract the synergies and the revenue and the financial you know, model that you had expected. So what do we do at BDG to help with that? So the first is investing in BDG's platform. So back in 2013, our founder and CEO, Brian Goldberg, uh, had a roll-up strategy in mind. So having a strong foundation and a platform uh, to ingest acquisitions in the right way was, is part of our DNA. So it's something that we always think about. So the, there's three aspects that I've kind of broken it down into. One is technology. So our technology team our uh, technology stack is all centralized as well, and at the heart of that, um, that stack is our custom CMS called Typeset. And this allows all our brands to run in a really uniform, consistent way, uh, even though all their editorial voices and you know, content that they cover is different. Um, we have similar editorial tools that are used across all our brands. Uh, similar design and aesthetic, as well as ad inventory and ad management, all consistent across one another. Um, but the other big thing is that it allows us to migrate new acquisitions relatively quickly and seamlessly onto our tech stack and allow them to operate kind of in the same vein as all our other brands, um, much more quickly than if it was a bespoke process each time. So that's a big part of you know the, the planning there. Number two is processes. So Processes is just a streamlined way of working that everyone knows how to operate and you know, approach problems and approach regular days, uh, regular tasks, right? So we have this established ways of working. They're supported by playbooks, guidelines, software. And so when a new company is brought in, you know, they're not learning from one person on how to do something. They actually know how to operate and follow the ways teams have already working. And it allows people to settle in much more quickly and also map how they used to work to how they are gonna work going forward in a much more you know, optimized way. Third is people and teams. Um, like most publishers, most, uh, we, a significant amount of our OpEx is people costs, right? It's our most valuable asset. Um, we never lose sight of that. Um, we support, you know, we invest into our centralized teams that are really responsible for taking acquisitions and running with them from day one. You know, our, the most largest one is our revenue organization. Um, but the other big piece to point to make out, to point out here is that we have people who have overseen a number of our acquisitions. Some people have been at BDG that have done all 10 acquisitions. And this is invaluable experience um, that you, know, you learn something every time you do one. You learn mistakes to avoid. You learn things that you should definitely do differently next time. Um, that muscle memory as well of how to approach an acquisition is so key. So we really, really value you know, that experience and make sure that it stays at BDG. The second big theme here is this 360 degree assessment of M&A targets. So deal rationale and financial assessment's a given, right? I don't, I don't need to explain that too much. You know, you need to know why you're buying a company and how it's gonna affect your top line and your bottom line. But if we stopped here, we'd have an incomplete picture. Um, it, you know, will their company actually work with us the right way? Will we all jive? Will people stay happy? Will they stay motivated? Uh, will their clients be retained because they're used to a level of service that they get? Are they going to continue getting that same service? How do we ensure all that? And to answer those questions, we focus on operational and cultural assessment. So I'm going to walk through some of the guidelines that I use to help 
um, our thinking when we were acquiring some spider, uh, some spider Studios, which was an acquisition we made uh, last year, closed um, late August 2021. With that acquisition, we acquired three brands, uh, Scary Mommy, Fatherly, and The Dad, and it really propelled us into a leadership position within the parenting space. Um, we also brought in major new advertiser relationships that not only run on those three brands, but now run across the BDG portfolio. And we brought in over 100 uh, full-time employees. So that's, that was you know, a big understanding that we're gonna have a, a, a cultural impact and you know, some operational things to work out. So tip one, build real relationships. So I think this feels like very common sense things, right? But you lose sight of these things when you're working in M&A and business. But if in a hum in, it's human nature, right? If you build a good rapport with someone, they're gonna open up more and you're gonna learn more information uh, if, they, if you get somebody who's gonna be open and honest with you. Um, and that information isn't gonna be sitting in a data room or it's not gonna be able to be extracted through formal diligence. But that's how you really learn how a company operates and how they actually work together. Um, so with some spider, we spent a ton of time with their CEO and founder. You know, I, he was practically on my speed dial um, and his inner circle uh, was spent a lot of time with our executive team and we really got that sense of you know, how they work together, who they are, right, as people. And specifically on the revenue organizational side, um, it was so strong, that connection, that we had a lot of conviction around the revenue synergies that we were modeling out, right? We had conviction that we would be able to retain the clients they had, that we could uh, service them the way they've already been serviced, um, and we could actually unlock a lot of the synergies that we had in our plan for this to all work. So that gave us that conviction. Number two is be genuinely curious. Um, if you're good at, effect, at effectively building these uh, relationships, then you should be in a position to ask a lot of questions, and you should do so, right? And these questions aren't the what questions that you can, again, write down or find in a data room. It's really the how and the why things are working. Um, again, you may not get the answers, right? I'm not saying that everyone's gonna be an open book, but you should ask the question, you'll probably get some information and at least sparks the right conversation. Um, with some spider, we, and this will be very applicable to this group, but we ended up uh, diving really into their programmatic business and they were doing some really smart tactics that honestly we weren't doing and you know we were able to value that part of the business in a different way than I think we would have if we hadn't gotten into that level of detail with them. Number three is be humble. Um, I think again there's a tendency as you know the acquirer you're the big fish and you know better um, and that you're gonna you know force your way of working onto people but sometimes a target can be doing something better and admit it, right? Um, what processes are better than ours? How can we learn from them? Um, so for some spider, we really like their top-down proactive sales approach. Um, they called it whales. Um, so basically the big advertisers, the Fortune 100s, Fortune 200s that they wanted to have as part of their portfolio, we liked how they identified those whales, we liked how they incentivized sellers to capture those whales, and we liked how successful they were doing uh, at doing so. So we've integrated this style, this approach into how we operate as well. Number four is map it out. Um, have a real plan, like a written, tangible, physical plan about how you're gonna bring in individuals, teams, and assets into the company. Um, you know, and also adjust your own structure to make way. Uh, so again, on the revenue organizational side, uh, with some spider, we were introducing a whole new category, right? Parenting. We had a parenting brand, but it was not large enough to stand on its own. Now we have this parenting portfolio. Um, and so we actually took the opportunity to reorganize our entire sales team to be category focused right at that point. Um, and we had it all settled before the company, well, right actually at close, so that we were able to put that into effect from day one when the new teams uh, came into BDG. And it's worked really well. Uh, number five is play it safe. So there's always a desire to generate cost synergies as fast as possible in M&A. I mean, there's no 
you know, everybody knows that. But you never know who the glue is that's holding everything together. You know, who's that mid-level person on that team that's really doing a lot of the work? Is that connective tissue across the organization, right? You also don't know, you know, some of the new, you know, experimental business areas that they've been investing in. Maybe one of them is going to be the future, right? Um, so almost as a policy, we are we rather be careful than to come when it comes to finding cost efficiencies um, than be quick and possibly have a big mess on our hands. So for some spider, um, we, there was a bunch of uh, ancillary businesses that we had less familiarity with as an organization. So um, AVOD channels, podcasting that we felt we couldn't get really into before close. So we had to. You know, basically, this is actually a time when you just recognize you can't actually take a lot of action before you close. Um, so we spent the time that we needed to with the right staff once those companies were in the door, and we weren't just looking at short-term revenue or profit impact, but more of like what's the long-term business plan around these. And you know, we decided to move forward with some of them. We decided to close some of them down. That didn't make sense to us, but we took the time, we took that beat to make sure that we had conviction around the decision we were making. And then lastly, be mostly transparent. Um, obviously, you can't share everything before you, uh, w when you're making an acquisition and closing on a deal. But if you're, if, if you can be transparent, um, it's it's good to share some of those post-close uh, plans with the target, especially if you're bringing in, you know, over a hundred FTEs from that organization, because the truth will come out. And if you catch people by surprise, it can you know damage relationships and sour the culture. So it's really important. So in conclusion, do your homework um, when you buy a house. You clearly don't want to close and then unlock the door and see a bunch of leaks everywhere, right? Same thing with, with M&A. You want to just be able to get as, as much information and you know, go in with your eyes wide open. Um, you know, you're not going to know everything, of course, but at least you and your team will be focused on setting the acquisition up for long-term success. All right, that's it. Thank you, Sharmi. We, uh, we have time for questions of Sharmi. Hi, uh, Dennis O'Neill with Insider. I was wondering if there's a, if one of your acquisitions included a technology that you were able to stretch across the portfolio, and if you could kind of like uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, we acquired the outline. Um, is there any way to go back on these slides? Oh, they're gone. Okay, um, and in that we actually the one of the interesting pieces to us was their t technology, and it was their card story technology. We've actually made it um, a pillar of how we d deliver our editorial content as well as our branded content. So essentially, it's these really stylized uh, click-through. On, on desktop, you can kind of see it as like a slideshow, but it's very seamless and beautiful. And then on mobile, it's very, a very easy ex um, experience. So that was at the core of that acquisition, yeah. Hi, thank you Hi. for this. Uh, my name's Jacqueline Cameron, and I'm with Axios. Uh, I am interested in the deal rationale component that you shared. Um, I'm curious if there are any trends in deal rationale that are emerging. So how are you making those decisions? Or, uh, is there a uh, content area that's starting to bubble to the surface that you want to explore more? Are there behaviors, consumer behaviors, that you're tracking more closely um, over the past year and a half? I'd be really interested in that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to say there's trends across all businesses. I think every business need is different. But, you know, for us, we've always been focused on how do we deepen the audience that we have, um, which is uh, primarily around the female um, 18 to 34 demo, um, but we've also thought about how do you widen that audience outside and you know focus more on on males. I think that story is different for other companies. You know they might be doing the same thing. You can also use acquisitions though to get into different you know ways of uh, delivering media, right? So you could be acquiring podcasting companies, video companies, you know other ways that you can actually reach your audiences in different platforms, um, and then of course there's a difference in monetization. So for us, you know, I mentioned that we bought one company to get into Experiential. Um, that company was Flavor Pill, and Experiential is now a growing part of our platform. Um, so we believe that it's great to be a, you know, an, a wonderful 
um, have a wonderful audience on site, but then how can we actually connect with them off site? Um, I think for other companies, it's similar um, ways to differentiate your revenue stream and how you, you know, how you connect with your audiences. But I think it's really different on, you know, depending on who you are and what you already have as a starting point with your assets. Um, Sharmi Fabricio from Axios as well. Uh, congrats on the presentation. Um, one, one, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Uh, what best practices can you share with us uh, when it comes to M and A uh, in, in our spaces? The, the tech stack integration. Uh, you know, I applaud your centralization of tech and yeah. stuff. But uh, in practice, uh, sometimes you find some very, uh, um, you know, ver varieties of Frankenstein's of, of tech stacks out there. I'd be curious to hear your, your best practices there too to uh, proceed with an acquisition where you can fully integrate uh, the acquired company into your uh, tech stack? Well, you know, I think some of it is easy to do quickly. Um, and, and we try to get, you know, the, a lot of people are using WordPress. I mean, we try to get them over to, you know, at least using our editorial tools and publishing the same way. Um, when it comes to, you know, more advertising tools that we, we've seen, we, Again, it's patience, right, to see how do we unwind some of the vendors that they've been using, um, how to, because we don't want to disrupt what's happening with clients. Um, so it's always like, let's phase these things in at the appropriate time. Um, but I, I think it's really about how do you isolate what you can do quickly versus what you have to take time doing, you know, and, and, and take a beat on so that you don't because as I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, with M&A, you don't have, you know, three to six months of a pause, right? You're still a live company that has to deliver value. So it's always those decisions of how do you make sure that you never uh, affect any, you, you, you never, I guess, threaten the, the revenue that you're, you're getting from that company um, and, and make sure that you make the decisions that you need to do at the right time, yeah. Sharmi is going to be leading the roundtable at the end of the morning on this very topic. Sharmi, that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thanks, guys.